Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Waterproof Records. Right now, I am so thrilled. I am so excited as we welcome the wonderful, the amazing, the talented Kay Hanley. Things are going to change. I can feel it. It just going to be that kind of body. Huzzah! 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 <laughs> my, You're here. Uh, my my dog Maisie is going to come join us for hello. I'm going to have a dog and cats just coming. A dog I and a cat mind. just coming in and out of the frame. Adds to the energy of the whole thing. Everybody knows K predominantly from Letters to Cleo. If you lived through the '90s, you know about Letters to Cleo, right? I mean, yeah, if you're my mom <laughs> or, or if you're from Dorchester. <laughs> Dorchester. That's one of the things that I didn't know about you. When I was researching and learning more about you, I found out you're from Dorchester. I've never been Dorchester. to Massachusetts. Do you get back there often? No. What? No. How, how have you never been to Massachusetts? In my long life that I've lived so far, I have yet to make my way out there. And I have so many friends that I've met through comedy and music that are from that yeah. wonderful place. And, uh, mm-hmm. and you're, you're one of many talented people to come out of that part of the world. And I grew up across the street from the Wahlbergs. I saw that and I wanted to yeah. fact check it because it was like, is that true? They were across the street true. from you? Hundred percent true. Wow. Yeah. Any any. Uh, so a lot of uh, a lot of like blue collar talent from my street. Yeah, yeah. And I'm There's saying like actors and writers and yeah. I'm saying Dorchester, but it's that's not the correct pronunciation if you're from there, right? You got to say Dorchester. Dorchester and people who are from Dorchester are dot rats. Mm. That's so we're the term? dot rats. Dot rats. Yep. Yeah, being a, that's what it says on my license plate, Dot Rat. Dot Rat, I love it. Yeah. That's so cool. It doesn't it say <laughs> that on the back of your records as well. Isn't there a Dot Rat thing on the back of the dot records? Dot Rat Records, yeah. Yes. Dot Rat Records, yeah. That's yeah. so cool. And weirdly, my daughter graduated from college last year and moved out of LA back to Boston, moved to Dorchester. She took a job. She's doing a year of service with Boston City Year, which is like, um, which is like, you know, uh, like AmeriCorps. It's like a right. volunteer organization. And uh, and she lives in Dorchester in a double decker a mile away from the house I grew up in. It's so weird. <laughs> it's so weird. It's so weird. Well, for, for people who watch the show, there's some that listen to the show only. But if you're watching the video version, you'll see I'm rocking a Letters to Cleo t-shirt right now, which I, I feel like that's allowed, right? You know the rule of you're not supposed to wear the band that you're going to see live. But I don't think they have any don't wear the t-shirt of the band you're interviewing on Zoom yet. You know, like I don't think that's a rule. No, definitely not. And I was so pleased to see it. It yes. made me feel like, oh, I'm wanted here. You are wanted here. And and <laughs> we got a chance to meet in person before we did this interview, which was such a cool mm-hmm. experience at the Troubadour um, in know. Hollywood. What? When was that? Was it in November? Am I remembering the that date right? That was in right? November. It was like there was like this five minute period of time when people were going back on tour back in the like er, late fall, early winter. Right. And we, we landed right in that spot. So we I played know. at the Troubadour. My son's band opened. Yes. And I got to meet you. And Jay Coyle was just like, you got to meet Jake. He's amazing. He's got this TikTok, thing, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and, and like Jay Coyle was just like fanboying out on you. And I was just like, who is this guy? And then as soon as I met <laughs> you, I was like, oh. I love him. Oh, so. that's so sweet of you to say. And I love <laughs> I love Jay so much. And just even getting the chance to come out and see you guys play and your son's band opening before. It was so <laughs> cool. It was such a fun night. And you're right about how it was this window of time where mm-hmm. everybody's got their vaccines and we're still being safe, but you start feeling like, okay, life is on the road to return to normal. And it was that pocket right there. Yeah. And then, mm-hmm. and then here we go. Again. And then, yeah, I know. Here we go I know. 
It's but it felt like it felt really, you know, I mean, for me, I've been doing this since I was 18, you mm-hmm. know, so, you know, being in a, so I kind of like, to me, this is, you know, I, I do have an appreciation for like how unusual it is to like be in a band and do it for so long. But like at the same time, it's like going to the office, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And, but, but the tour in November was like, after everything we've been through and everything it took to get to that moment, like I just will, and just that the clubs that survived, that the people like tending bar, like had their jobs back and just like, just the loss and the, you know, it, know. um, it just felt very, it felt very intense and like, yeah. I'll never take these, like, I'll never take rock clubs for granted again. Like totally, you know, it's home yeah. and yeah. What a cool venue the Troubadour is. I'd, I'd had the chance to be there for a few other shows in the past, but I hadn't been in a while. And to, to kind of return to uh, see you guys play, such a great show, so much fun energy. The crowd was just loving it. And yeah. it was just, it was an exciting, it was an exciting night. And I have a, a, a precious gift now, which is Aurora Gory Alice signed so this nice. is now one of my prized possessions. I'm so happy that I got to meet you guys that night. So, yeah. And yeah. now we're here. And now, and now we're I'm on here. your podcast. You now you're on the podcast. I, even, I like put on makeup for you on a Sunday. Like So did I. I dolled up. <laughs> <laughs> I dolled up. Well, I, I, you know, I was so nervous when, before we started talking. And then in the moment we began speaking, I was like, hey, we do feel like we could be like old friends. Like we go way back. You oh, know? totally. We have that, we have yeah. that rapport. We got right the thing. Yeah. yeah, you get the thing. You got the thing. But I, I, uh, I was researching you and I was trying to be a good host and know all the stuff going in. And I was, I've probably spent so many hours now just reading Kay Hanley stories and like things that you have going on <laughs> and how, how prolific you have been outside of Letters to Cleo. So incredibly prolific and have worked so much. And, you know, people who listen to the show, if you're not familiar, Kay did the voice for Rachel Lee Cook's character in Josie and the Pussycats. And she's, mm-hmm. you know, written music for Doc McStuffins, which played when my <laughs> son was younger. And so many cool things, the soundtracks, the solo albums, you know, you have, have really put out a lot of work and music over the past several decades. And I just, I was blown away by how much you've done. I'm a very lucky person. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's weird. I'm, I'm unemployable in any other medium. It's like, I'm lucky that I keep getting these opportunities. Like just people keep, the phone keeps ringing and I keep being like, I think I can do that. And yeah. then, you know, yeah. <laughs> do so yeah, absolutely. 30, 35 years later, you know, it's so great. still doing it. But I, lo- I love my, my job now is right. I write music for animation, you know, animated mm-hmm. TV. And so I write songs for cartoons all day, every day. And it's like, it's the perfect, perfect job for me. I yeah. just, I pinch myself. I can imagine. I can imagine. It's yeah. really catchy music, really fun. It feels good to put content out there for children. You know what I mean? To put entertainment in this world that is good. Cause as a parent, sometimes you see yeah. stuff and you go, Oh my God, this is the worst shit I've ever seen. And I don't want to expose my children to this terrible (laughs) content. And so it's not only inspires you to create something that you think is like catchy and cool and fun. And that the songs being played around houses of, uh, of parents will be like, Hey, that's pretty nice. I like that. And the people, the person, the person that, that I write music for the most is this woman named Chris knee who, um, you know, she worked on Sesame Street, but she also worked on like, you know, the deadliest catch and stuff like, like she's just gotcha. been in television forever. And, um, she created Doc McStuffins for her son and, uh, who had asthma and she was trying, she was, you know, wrote in children's television and was trying to figure out a, a way that maybe she could create a character that would help her son not be afraid when he had to go to the hospital for like a nebulizer treatment when he had an asthma attack and stuff. So that was the impetus for Doc McStuffins. And then it ended up being just like, I mean, now she just like rules everything and, you know, wins all the, but she is such an incredible storyteller. And like, she doesn't write kids stories. She writes real stories. Like she, the way she describes it is like, she's talking to herself as a a kid and kids are 
not babies. They are people and they want interesting stories that they relate to. And so to work, you know, in the service of such an incredible storyteller, like, and I think, I think that's why I, it was so hard to, not that it was hard to be in a band, but I didn't like it. I never felt comfortable being like the lead singer of a band and really all the, all the, you know, no, no, I, I never did. And I sabotaged us a lot cause I didn't, I resented it and, you know, like having to do what people told me, like sell myself as a product and stuff. But yeah. I love writing songs and I love, you know, all the other stuff that's not so writing songs for someone like Chris, who's like this incredible storyteller who just like, I mean, her brain. And then I get to work in the service of her creative vision. Sure. So it has nothing to do with me. It's yeah. like, it's just like, I can, I, I know how to help her bring her script from point A to point B with a song, you know, and it's just, yeah. It's awesome. That's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. And you talked a little bit about just kind of the the burden on, you know, when we are big personalities and we're we're put in these positions. You're a songwriter. You're creative, and then the being the front person of a of a band and being told, you know, where where that that line where art and and commerce come together, right? Mm-hmm. It's we have to like market ourselves and sell ourselves. And it just, it it has to be really strange for the person kind of standing at that front of stage with the microphone and, and always feeling like, why can't I just do the thing that I love? Why does it always have to be about all these other things? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. I mean, when, when Greg and I, my cousin, Greg McKenna and I started, or actually his, I was the backup singer in his first band, Rebecca Lula. Yes. The bass player was the lead singer. Greg wrote all the lyrics and melody. He wrote all the songs. And I was just like, he, you know, he was like, Hey, do you, do you want to, you know, he knew that I sang with my mom at mass and stuff. And he yeah. was like, Hey, you want to be in my, want to be the backup singer on my band? And I was like, fuck yeah. I want to be the backup singer in your <laughs> yeah, band. Yeah. <laughs> why wouldn't I? How old were you and then? then 18, 18. I was like, I think I was just graduating from high school maybe. Yeah. And, um, and to, to get, will actually, actually, the Smiths have something to do with the story. That's what I want to hear. I want to, let's dig in when, uh, when I, before we had this podcast, I, I told Kay, I said, tell me the album, uh, that, you know, really changed your life as a, as an artist and as a musician. And, and like you told me, that's a hard decision to make that, that album. Yeah. Well, it's, it is. And I mean, picking like an album that like changed, or like just blew your mind or, I mean, I have many, so many, um, but my, so when I was, so my sister, Patricia, um, she's 18 months younger than I am. And I was like in high school, like, you know, teased hair, cheerleader, pink lipstick, top 40 radio. And, you know, just very kind of like, just a, you know, like a dot girl and mm-hmm. like really basic, yeah, you know? Yeah. And my sister was like a stoner and like scientist and was like building like, you know, working exhibits of aerodynamics for the science <laughs> fair. And like, and, yeah. and she was, she started getting into like all these, like she got into like you two and like the alarm before anyone else did. Yeah. And one day I came home from school and she had a tape that she she was listening to this tape and how soon is now came on. And I was like, I have a chill just thinking about it. I was like, what the fuck? Totally. What is this? What is this? Yeah. And like, I, I just was like, a couple of days later, I started wearing all black, like took off the, like, and then, you know, like a couple, you know, like within a year I was in a band, you know? Yeah. It was like, it just, changed everything. And I, of course I didn't know, I couldn't research what record I think Trisha had like a mixtape that how soon is now was on. So I just got a Smith's record and, uh, and I got the queen is dead and I just listened to it every day around the clock. I think I, the tape broke, I taped back together as you did back then. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, just like hearing someone 
like I didn't, it was so British and so like, you know, so of a different place and like, it was just completely, I just never heard anything like it, but he was talking about stuff that like, I, you know, it was also melodramatic too. And totally. like when you're a teenager, like Morrissey. all your feelings are just like, oh. so like big, <laughs> I just felt like he was just like, just like, just like reaching out of the boom box and just grabbing my soul and put, you know, absolutely. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's such a turning point when you hear those albums and, and it's so true. It's, when you mm. say an album that changes your life, there's so many chapters of our lives growing up and in the, uh, you know, everything from hearing a, a Beatles record for the first time to, uh, you know, a classical piece of music or whatever it is. And even like you said, you sang in mass, there's pieces of music yeah. from that that transform us. But there is that moment okay. in your adolescence and in your formative years that you hear and a switch goes on in your brain. And and I love yeah. that it was dismissed for you. You know, you shut your mouth. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> so dramatic and oh so great. Oh my god! And the Johnny Marr guitar, oh. like I was just like, what? I just couldn't. I just never. It was like it. It was just. It was so. It just moved yeah. me. Like it really. Yeah. Like I literally changed overnight from hearing yeah. that song. Yeah, absolutely. Overnight. And and the Queen Became is Dead person. is a great album. So you didn't, you know, even though that you were looking for How Soon Is Now and you came across the Queen Is Dead, it's still a fantastic. Yeah. Album. I didn't listen to Meet His Murder until like many, many years yeah. later. Yeah. Probably. I got Strange Ways Here We Come after that. And I love that record too. But yeah. My brother and I, he was a big music guy too, but because he was a little bit old older than me, he could show me things that were, you know, had come before. And definitely he was the one who had the Smiths albums, but he was really big into the cure. And back then, I'm sure you remember right. there was a which it it wasn't even really a rivalry. They've gone on to say it was just kind of like jabs in the media back and forth at each other, you know, Morrissey and Robert Smith. But if you were like a cure fan, I felt like there was this stigma about like, well, you can't also be a Smiths fan. <laughs> but you know, I, it was, I was not familiar with that. Yeah. With that dynamic at all. Cause yeah. I was the only person in my world who was listening to the Smiths aside from my sister and sure. my little sister and her weird friends. And then, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a weird, <laughs> it was a weird dynamic, but of course the internet didn't exist. So it's not like it could, I think we only knew right. about it because somebody said something to somebody and it was like, Oh, so if you like the cure, you can't like, you know, or vice versa. But yeah. my, br my brother didn't care either way. He had the Smiths, he had, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had cure albums, but, but, uh, such, such an iconic voice, Morrissey. Have you ever crossed paths with him in your musical career? Has he ever been shared the stage with you anywhere? Probably a good thing. No, he's probably a prick. Yeah, I, he's <laughs> yeah, he's you know the by the time you know the nineties, like all those guys just kind of disappeared. Mm -hmm. And I got really after that, you know, I, you know, I got really into local Boston music, and yeah. like there was such a robust scene. Well, actually, I had a couple more stops along the way after the Smiths. Like we had, because in Boston we had. WFNX and BCN that played the most yes. amazing. Well, FNX especially had the most amazing music. Yeah, and like they, I, they turned me on to everything. Like I, when I heard the Sugar Cubes for the first oh, time, I birthday love it. by the Sugar. Yeah. What? You know, <laughs> like I, I spent my and like every day just listening to the radio, going like, what? What is this? <laughs> this is so and like, good. And we also had like we also had like. The Boston Phoenix, which was the weekly arts and entertainment that, that everybody just like waited for it to come out. And we had all these zines and we had all these like rock clubs and bands. And th yeah. it was just you never had to leave Boston to like fi find your rock stars and your stories. And, you know, it's just amazing. And and the and the radio stations played local music. So like. Letters to Cleo got on the radio in, in Boston. Yeah. Like on our first tape that we made. That's a, that's amazing. Tape. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Cause, cause you know, yeah. A city like Boston and these big, big cities, th that's where that opportunity, you know, I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So definitely not. Oh my, that's the... where Stacy Jones, our drummer is from. It, wow. He's really? From Tulsa. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. Was Stacy playing Loyal drums people. at the Troubadour show? No, that was Tom. Tom. So Stacy was our drummer for whole for Aurora and Wholesale. Right. And then he left and the joined nerve. fucking Baruch Assault. <laughs> oh my gosh. He joined Baruch Assault. And oh. I was like, 
what? And then we, and then Tom played with us on go. Yeah. So, and then after that, the band broke up. Yeah. But so. then Stacy's been back um, since, right? Stacy's come oh, back. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Gotcha. yeah. Stacy played, you know, we all play together whenever we can, but I love playing with Tom too. So yeah. he's a, yeah, really amazing create. We've had, I'm spoiled. I've had like the most amazing drummers based, just everyone I play with is just so good. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. I love that he's from Tulsa. I wonder, wonder from where, yeah. We're, you know, a few years apart, but I, I moved away. Um, I moved away at the end of high school and, you know, haven't been back since really, but, but, uh, the, where did the, you, did you go to LA at that point? Where did you no, go? I ended up in the Chicago land area, the Chicago suburbs, yeah. went to school up there. And then I ended up in LA in 2001. So I have been here for about 20, 20 plus years, um, with my wife and we have kids and, you know, now, now we're here, kids are in school you know, yeah. not no plans of going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> same, same. We moved here in 2003 when yeah. Henry was seven months old. Wow. And Zoe Mabel was four. Yeah. So you put your and roots now, down. Yeah. Well, I just kind of feel like I'm on an extended business trip. Like, I'm just kind of <laughs> like, can we, are we ready to leave? When are we? Can we leave? Totally. Yeah. And like, I can't cause like my work is just, it just keeps getting better and better and better. And like, yeah, yeah. just waiting to hit the jackpot so I can work from Cape Cod, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know you do stay busy. That's for sure. You've got a lot of work yeah. out there. A lot of music I mean, if out you're there. lucky, if you're lucky, if it's, this is a tough place to be, if you're not yeah. busy, Yeah, it's like, it can really, it can be pretty depressing. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Oh, I know. <laughs> 20 years. And now you're a city. big TikTok star. Oh, oh, but it's after years and years and years of so many projects and things just going, hello, hello. I made all these things. I made all this stuff and nobody's listening. Mm -hmm. And then here I am in my 40s, a dad on a pandemic making yeah. TikToks. And I was like, uh, OK, I guess this is what I'm doing now. <laughs> so funny it's so funny you, that's how it goes though i know i know you just keep throwing things at the wall and hoping something sticks i guess but yeah. uh <laughs> but you know i love it music has always been such a huge part of my life and i was wondering if um if your household as a kid was it filled with music or did you have to kind of seek it on your own i know you told me that you uh. you flip the switch and before that you were the pink lipstick and what was on the top 40 radio so what was it like in your right. house as a kid well, um, lots of AM radio mm -hmm. and back then AM radio played, um, music in between like news and stuff yeah. like, so I remember like, like Kenny Rogers into like Linda Ronstadt into yeah. like, you know, Manhattan transfer, you know, it's just yeah. weird. Um, but I have such fond memories of like my dad's transistor radio and just like he and having breakfast and like that tin, you know, that transistor radio totally. sound. Um, and my dad, my, you know, my mom didn't really like music that much. Um, she was pretty, we, you know, we were a very, very devout Catholic, Irish Catholic family in yeah. Dorchester, you know, pretty typical. And, uh, and my dad liked, he had such weird taste. He, he liked Elvis and a couple of musicals, but like weird musicals. Like he, he liked, um, like Porgy and Bess and also like Camelot. It was weird. It was yeah, just the weirdest. Yeah, like, yeah, I and, get it. And we weren't allowed to watch TV. My mom did not think that TV was good for, and she was right. She was kind of ahead of her time. Um, and she, uh, so we, and also like, we didn't really have a, t like we, sometimes we would have a TV. Um, but most of the time we, it would just be broken and just sitting there. And, um, and I could only watch like Donnie and Marie or like zoom or Sesame street and electric company. But like, once I got to be older, like I wasn't allowed to watch. So I have like this huge gap in my, like, pop culture knowledge from like totally. the seventies and eighties, like TV shows that I never saw. Yeah. Um, and, but I was like, I just loved radio and I would just, did you do that thing when you were younger where you would like sit with your, your, your tape deck next to the speaker and wait for your favorite song to come on and 100%. like hit record and play. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I wish I still had those tapes. Cause I know, you know, 
but, um, but I loved, I had my, my version of punk rock was, um, was rap and, um, and we were very into rap. Like run DMC was like my dead Kennedy's. Like it was the thing that I just loved. It was rebellious. My parents didn't want me to listen to it. You know, me and my friends like learned all the words to every single run DMC and run DMC song and, you know, Eric B and Rakim and like, I love it. PMD. And like, I just loved rap so much. And, um, and then there was like disco. I loved, I still love disco. I fucking love disco <laughs> yes. from the eighties. Like, yeah. and, um, and then I had a stop off in high school, like with Ozzy weirdly, just like this minute where I really got into Ozzy Dyer, the madman. Yeah. And then back to disco and then, <laughs> and then I the sets. I love it. Such a cool musical journey. I can relate. <laughs> I, I, I was not Irish Catholic, but I was raised in a very, very religious Protestant, you know, went to Methodist church, was in the church. And so I had a similar dynamic, which was my dad loved, you know, classic rock and Zeppelin and the doors and Hendrix and all that. But my mother, she was so traditional. She liked only Mm -hmm. classical music. She liked, you know, Willie Nelson and she liked the Beatles, you know, but the Beatles before the drugs, you know? And so she, she liked that kind of stuff. So my brother and I, when we would start getting into, you know, we got into, we went through a real big heavy metal phase and she would just be like, boys, that sounds evil, you know? And it was just, we and oh, we were totally totally and so we weren't allowed to watch MTV and and to your, we'd have to hide it you know like or we could watch it like during the day but when it got to be the more you know the controversial like programming later. she was like no uh but we used to tape off the radio i did the same thing we uh, being in yeah. a small town like Tulsa we had this Roger State College which was this like somewhere out there broadcasting like you know cure pixies dead milkmen things like that and my brother and i are just recording it so we're like the only kids in our in our public middle schools that are sitting there talking about these bands and everybody's like what are you we're we're listening to like, cnc music factory right now anything by yeah. d pesh gumbo yes, i remember yes. you'll dance to anything yes, you'll dance <laughs> to anything Anything by D. Peshka Mode. <laughs> <laughs> so great. I remember that we song. Had, so Boston in w, WBCN in Boston had this show on Sunday nights called Nocturnal Emissions. Oh, no, wait. No, Sunday nights was local emissions. Okay. But well, during the week, it was Oedipus had nocturnal emissions, and he would play all this, like, weird shit that, like, yeah, yeah. you know, he would – and dead. I remember hearing, like, Dead Milk Bed and, like, all <laughs> All other, that crazy stuff. Yeah. 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 Bitch and Camaro. <laughs> You know, and like Camaro. Fugazi yeah. and like, um, there was what I, as we were talking, I thought of a story and now it, oh, when I was like 11, all I wanted was ACDC, the Dirty Deeds record. Yes. That's all I wanted. But my mom would, any records, she would like look at the liner notes, like read the lyrics and like. So I could never listen. I was not allowed to listen to anything. So for Christmas, like I asked my aunt Peg, who was like, she was like a spinster, but she was like really fucking, she hated all everyone else except for me. And I was like, aunt Peg, would you get me, um, dirty deeds done dirt cheap by ACDC for Christmas? And she was like, ah, sure. So she did. She, she, when I went over to, you know, grandma Hanley's house for Christmas, um, (laughs) <laughs> she, I got it. And, and I unwrapped it. I was like, Oh my God, thank you. The first thing my mom did was take the record, unwrap it, look at the, and she saw big balls and she was like, Mm-mm. she fucking threw it away. I Ugh. was not allowed. My friends went to see it. I was not allowed to go. And when I was 22, ACDC was no, probably 27. Yeah. ACDC was playing at the Boston garden and it was right when cell phones came out. And so I got a ticket and I walked in and I called my mom and I was like, guess where I am? Yes. Yes. I love it. ACDC. ACDC, mom. You can't stop me, mom. Oh, we we are so similar. This is exactly (laughs) what my mother did. She would go through the liner notes, the albums, and if she saw profanity, oh, it's gone. It's out of here. We'd have to review everything. And the funny thing is my brother and I, to this day, we, we, we talk about how every time she 
you know, banned us or got us further away from an artist based on that stuff. It just made us love it more. And we sought oh, after yeah. it more. And now, you know, he and I go see these heavy metal shows and we still to this day, we're like, this is all the stuff that mom didn't want us to hear. And now we're like diehard <laughs> fans, you know, so yeah. can't like, stop us. <laughs> can't stop no, us, can. mom. <laughs> she weirdly let me go see Prince. Like I was obsessed with Prince. And yeah. um, weirdly, I don't know how she missed that. Yeah. Let me go see Prince at, at the Wista Centrum. Maybe because I was maybe I was in the eighth grade by then. And yeah, she had kind of she had more kids by then. It was like, yeah, <laughs> whatever. I just asked yeah. my mom the same question. I was remembering she let me and my brother one of the first shows we got to go see. This was 1993. We got to go see um, uh, Flaming Lips, Butthole Surfers and Stone Temple Pilots. And she goes, oh, wow. and, and I brought it up to her and I go, why did you let us go? And she goes, I, I don't remember letting you go. So I must have been really busy with life. You know, she just, and now as a parent, I realize I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, that could totally happen. Like you can be a watchdog oh, yeah. for so long. And then one day you're going to be asked something and be like, yeah, 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 fine. <laughs> because you're just, your, your focus is in other places. You're like, is it, are you, is this going to make you bleed or anything like that? Will you die? Yeah, okay, you, go you're going to survive. You're going with yeah. your brother, right? Get out of here. Get out of my hair. Yeah, you know? fine. Bye. Yeah, yeah exactly. But <laughs> totally. it's, it's so fun. But I, I love it so much. And so this point in your life, you've, you've listened to this miss, you've turned that switch, you're in letters to Cleo and you're playing in the band. And you said that you got that cassette on the radio relatively easy. And so what a cool start to your career that you guys were embraced right out of the, out of the gate as a band, right? Well, yes and no. Okay. Um, I, well, first of all, I didn't think of it as a career. I mean, I'm from like, this is not a career move for me. It's like, yeah, to, it was just like, I was in a band with my cousin. Like it was just something fun that we were doing. Like yeah. I worked at, you know, I worked at, um, hard rock cafe as like a waitress. And then I, you know, I just was doing waitressing. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I knew I wanted to be a writer, but like, yeah. to me being in a band, being the singer of a rock band was like incredibly, um, that's the word that I'm looking for. Um, uh, just frivolous. Like, yeah. that's not something that you do. You go work for the Edison or you go to, you get a union job, right. something that has benefits and like a pen and, you know, and make sure that you are, you know, it was just not a career option for me. I never thought of it that way. It was just like this fun thing that I, I loved going to band practice. I loved, you know, play getting a gig at local clubs and, you know, it was just really it was a hobby. Yeah. It was just like, so when, when sister, the sister tape, um, you know, which we made and Greg and I were such dot rats, you know? So yeah. it was like yeah. us going to like, you know, going to Cambridge to Fort Apache to like, we were just like, this is, you know, like it seemed like we were going to New York to yeah, like make totally. a record, you know, it's just like, this is where the, and that was where I saw the Pixies poster for the first time at Fort Apache. I was like, it, everything to me was just such a surprise to, yeah. that the world was so cool and different once you left Dorchester, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so what, but we were like always the least cool band of the, in a city of just such cool bands. And I do remember that, um, when you would send a tape to, to BCN, they would actually give you feedback, you know? Really? And I remember someone saying, that um that the that the lyrics to sister the actual song were very predictable and i was just like really <laughs> i wrote it about my sister but i wrote it was like one of the first songs it was the, the lyrics were very predictable he was right but right. but because we had so much the radio stations like they had they gave hours of airtime every sunday night to local bands so cool and so to get your tape on, you know, that was kind of what happened. Yeah. If you had a record, you know, songs that even if your song sucked, they would still play them. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and how dramatically did life change once Aurora Gorealis got, you know, went from being this cassette that you put out and then it now it's being re-released on a major label and you're going to be going on tour. Did, was it, was it like an overnight change or did it just kind of, transition slowly over time, like within a course of a couple months to a year? Well, 
you know, I mean, for us, we, we were always, once let, once we broke up that old band and started letters to Cleo and, you know, we, um, we were always on the road, like we had a van and, you know, we just always were doing like, you know, work a double shift on Thursday and then like that night, get in the van and drive to New York and then just play, you know, New York, DC, Philly and come back. And, yeah. you know, we were always doing that stuff and then we would start going along. So we were always on the road. And when, when, when you're doing that, when you're playing like that, yeah. um, you know, you get good, you get, and you know, we, and there were just lots of, there was sort of like this pipeline that began to develop in the nineties that we were very much a part of, which is like, you, you know, people were starting to pay attention to the kind of music that we were all making and right. it was on the radio. And all of a sudden all the, you know, the, um, what is it called? Like the alt rock. Totally. Was like, you know, it was like, that was like a format at radio that completely was serviced by bands like ours. And so a lot of our peers were getting record deals and getting signed. So it's like, of course, that's what we would want to do. So, um, in 93, I think, when we put out the cherry, the local cherry disc version of Aurora Gorealis, um, the weekend of our South by Southwest, which we would had been playing South by for years at that yeah. point. And, um, but 93, we got to South by and Steve white from billboard reviewed the cherry disc version of Aurora on the cover of billboard. Wow. And so Larry Webman and our booking agent and Michael Creamer, our manager, like went to Kinko, like mimeographed like a million of them and just went down to the Four Seasons and handed them out to I love it. all the A&R people. And a bunch of A&R people showed up at our show. And and also a bunch of like our friends from like – and the internet had just started. So like we yeah. had like these weird like MIT like message board people like a lot of scientists and shit were like fans just, of the band just of getting the, on the dial up internet just on dial up <laughs> like excited to go see letters to cleo i love it those <laughs> message boards it was so it was a very interesting time and so a, a ton of people were there like our friends and fans and stuff like came, sang along to every word it was a great show and we got that thing going where the phone was ringing people were taking us to the we used to call it the lobster blowjob, <clears throat> just like take, take the lobster blowjob. No, that's good. And I'm telling you to this day, there is nothing I like better than like free food. Like yeah. when people buy me food, I'm just oh like, I, I love it. And so, um, we were kind of just like in the excitement of the moment. I don't think we realized what it would, so when it finally had, when we signed with giant records and they were doing the Melrose place soundtrack and we were on tour and all of a sudden they're asking us to do play at like Melrose place nights at bars. And I was just like, ew, like, even though I loved Melrose place, I was like, right. I'm not playing opening for Melrose place. At totally. <laughs> totally. What an odd change that would have been. Right. And that was the beginning of like, Ooh, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to like this. And yeah. then another thing that happened was, um, when we went to go make the video for awake, our second thing, like the next year after here and now had been like a big hit and, right. and everybody kind of, I started to get, I had to stop wearing ponytails because the pigtails, cause which was the way I wore my hair a lot because yeah. people would be like, Oh, you look like that girl. And I'd be like, Oh, that's weird. Yeah. And so I stopped wearing my hair and picked up. We showed up at the label before doing the video for a wake. And I had dyed my hair fire engine red. Cause yeah. as you do, as you do, and, it was the nineties um, and that was a good choice. And the marketing people like, or the kind of like flipped out a little bit that like I looked different. Wow. And, and, um, they didn't really know what to do with that. And, it was just, I, I just didn't like it. I felt like once I had to do it and once people were looking at me in that way, yeah, it felt, um, I really resented it. Yeah. That makes sense. So, that makes sense. And so yeah. this is on wholesale meats and fish, which is your second 
studio album mm-hmm. a wig was on and mm-hmm. for again for every, anybody watching the cover of it is right behind you there it is that is the original artwork the original painting by dean styers yeah that was hanging in the middle east in uh in, in central square in cambridge when we were trying to come up with the name for the record yeah and we just he had he just happened to have a show up at the time and we just loved this image and it's Very much of the time, like back then, it was like kind of like the height of the AIDS epidemic. And so like a lot of sex was, you know, deadly, you know, like we we started to develop this like connection between, um, you know, that sex could kill you. Yeah. And it was very weird. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. It's a great painting and it's so cool that it hangs up right there in the room. What a collectible. This is the first time that I've ever had it. We just kind of rearranged this room and it's, this is the first time I've ever had it above my, you know, in my bedroom. Yeah. So yeah. like it's usually hanging, you know, and, it, but it just seemed like it seemed so bright. I was like, Oh, it's time for yeah. it to be more, have more of an intimate relationship with this painting. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I'm assuming it's funny because when I heard it as a teenager, it probably just went, right over my head but wholesale meats and fish i'm guessing that is a a reference to the sexuality of of being on sale uh well it's not the sexuality but the the sort of like commodification of us you know like we're just a wholesale meats and fish yes 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 like we're just you know we're like a warehouse good yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I was linking the yeah. flesh, the meat, the fish, the, you know, and I was like, okay, yeah. I gotcha. But I see, <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean. That's cool. That's cool. Very cool. And then you guys did go as the last one in the nineties mm-hmm. before the, the band split ways. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. So mm-hmm. cool. And then, but you, you guys have come back, you did some reunion tours over the years and then now you're, you're back at it again since 2016, basically. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So we're just, we just tour, we, we get together once a year in November. Really, it's just a way to kind of like, I mean, I, th- we started doing it cause it just happened to where to start. There's so many stories with Cleo, but the, the gotcha. reason that <laughs> we, we like decided to get together in what was it like 2015 or something and start writing songs and we you know made back to nebraska and uh it just happened to be ready for like a november tour and we had so much fun doing it and the thing the thing that was crazy about it was that like all these people there were a bunch of people who did not become familiar with the band until like 10 things i hate about you or josie and the pussycats or the craft and people who just like discovered us through like movie soundtracks yeah. just assumed that they would never see, you know, bought all of our records, but the band had broken up. So there was, so all of these people who had been fans of ours for over a decade or whatever, who just assumed they'd never get to see us all like came out and they were like stoked and we had so much fun and yeah. we decided to just do it every November. So yeah, I love that. And that's it, what we do. It, it, uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the soundtracks because yeah, it, 10 things I hate about you. You're in there as yourself in the movie. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And then, and then on the, uh, the craft soundtrack, that's a cars cover. Correct. You did your homework. Yes. Jacob. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Absolutely. And we got Greg Hawks from the cars to come play on it. And yes. then he came and did the video and now we're friends with him and. He's amazing. Just the greatest guy. I love it. And so, then you also yeah. did a song for a Reese Witherspoon film in 2005. That's right. We did Lust for Life. Yeah. Yeah. Cover of Iggy Pop. Yeah. Yeah. You've done That's some right. great covers. You did I Want You to Want Me, right? You guys played that yeah. uh, the Troubadour. Got to see you do that one live. It was awesome. We did. We, we kind of just that, – that is just like it's part of the set now because people just – They expect at it. At this point, it's like I'm not even – trying to be cool. It's like when we're playing, I'm not trying to pull out the deep cuts or anything. It's like, I want people to like, as opposed to like when I was younger, right? Like I wanted to just like only play the stuff that I wanted to play. And yeah, but now it's like, it's really just about having like, just having fun and just playing everything that everybody wants to hear. 
Yeah. You know? Well, I think that, you know, what I notice just in the, the short time that we've gotten to know each other is that you enjoy bringing joy to others. And this is a big part of how you do this as a songwriter for children's entertainment. And when I saw you perform live, that show was all about, I want everybody in this room to have the best night and have the most <laughs> fun and enjoy the hell out of themselves. We've been cooped up for far too long. <laughs> And it yeah. really is evident that you do that and you believe that in your heart is that I think that's what shifts, you know, when we are teenagers and we're cool and we want things to be deep and we want to be different. Mm -hmm. When you get older, it's just that perspective, that shift. You have a family, mm -hmm. you, you become more grateful for the things that you've been given and you go, all I want to do is I just want to, I just want to bring happiness and, and yeah. good, good times. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and with this, it's like, it's not how I make a living. I don't resent it anymore. Yeah. It's like just doing it like a couple of times a year allows me to like really enjoy it. Yeah. And like, I don't, nothing there, nothing is riding on it. Yeah. I'm not like trying to get a good review. I'm not totally. trying to, yeah. you know, sell a record. It's like, I'm just trying, you know, it's just like, getting together with my family, with my brothers and playing some rock songs. And, and just, I think also just having like having a career letters to Cleo gave me a career. Yes. The reason that people took, took my phone calls later on is because I had that one, we had that one hit on the radio. We were really cool to the people at the radio stage, like all the interns and stuff who are now running. Totally. Everything. Totally. You know, like, we, we went, we took the interns out to shoot pool and drank, snuck them beers and got them into the show. And, yeah. and like, and that came that, so if there's anything I can ever, any advice I can impart, it's like, be nice to the roadies, be nice to the interns, be nice to all the underlings, because they're going to be running the show when you want some people to take your phone call. And, so true. you know, I was able to, you know, just from that one period of my life, I was able to, you know, create, you know, take advantage of just like little opportunities that allowed me to get to a different place. And it's, and this is, you know, the career that I have now is just like, just pinch myself. Yeah. Yeah. And it is so cool you know? when you take the, having to do the the band as a career, it does allow you to mm. appreciate the art for what it is, you know, just, just getting right. a chance, the opportunity to sing to a group of people, record some music, hang out with your, your, your family, your, no your one gets people. to do that. Yeah. Right. What a cool, what a cool gig. There was something that I saw along the way and I didn't know this and I don't know. It, uh, I know it's been a while, but 1994, you were in Jesus Christ Superstar uh, opposite mm -hmm. Gary Sharon from Extreme as Mary yeah. Magdalene. What was that like? Yeah. Oh, that was so sweet. Was that like 96, 95? Or maybe it was later. The dates might have been messed up. You know, the internet, you can't trust anything. Else. I think it was like 95. Yeah, it was about 95. Something like it was around that yeah. time. And I, I remember, um, so Boston rock opera is just like a bunch of, it's just, it's, it's literally people from the Boston rock scene, but yeah. who like the ones who like sort of like drama, you know, theater sure. dorks and stuff like, I'm yeah. still friends with many of them. Yeah. And, um, I remember there was this, the, the few years before you know, they did Jesus Christ superstar every year and Gary had played Jesus before. And there was another woman from another band who was playing, uh, Mary Magdalene and everybody loved her. And I'll never forget. Like I, I didn't realize this. Like I walked into like the first rehearsal and I was terrified. Cause I sure. don't see, I don't know. I loved, I loved that. I loved those songs so much. I knew sure. all of them, like the back of my hand, but like I walked into like this sort of like gymnasium and the whole cast is sitting and I could just feel that like just people staring like I didn't know any of them yeah. and everyone's just staring at me yeah. and I was like okay this is really scary and I sang uh they just made me sing everything's all right and when I was done <laughs> 
everybody just clapped and Aww. like yelled so and they were so nice to me <laughs> that's like, lovely is, and i became a theater dork like yeah, immediately yeah. but we had we had such a great time and gary was just such a wonderful weirdo and the first creationist I've ever met. I didn't know anything about people who believed in like creation. He had tons of kooky beliefs. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> he's another Boston like, guy, right? Gary's a, another yeah, Boston guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's so cool. So, I, I'm also a theater dork. I grew up in theater. And so when I saw it, I was like, okay. I got I to gotta bring this up as well. That was always the tough part for me is I'm, you know, an extroverted theater actor guy, you know, hence the reason why I even came to L.A. in the first place. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I was also into, you know, alternative grunge metal, all that kind of stuff. So it's a really weird juxtaposition growing up, uh, you know, where you're like, you want to be like, ha ha. And you also want to <laughs> wear black and flannel and yeah. Mo- and mope in your bedroom and so <laughs> and you're from tulsa and i'm from tulsa <laughs> right right not a, yeah. not a lot of great music came out of tulsa i mean stacy we know came out of tulsa but we had uh yeah. we have uh out in the out in the boonies we had garth in yukon oklahoma and we had uh mm-hmm. in in my hometown was hansen and um <gasps> yeah mm-hmm. Yep. A great vocalist. He's a fantastic oh vocalist. And that he got was like the yeah. best song. Yeah, yeah. It's super catchy. And then we had, I think, from maybe yeah, Color Me Bad, I think, came from Oklahoma City. But anyway, those those guys, I don't, I don't know what they're up to. They but. were our label mates. Really? They were on the same label? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what was their hit? I adore Mia Moore. Wasn't that their hit? I oh. wanna sex you. Oh, that's up. what it was. I wanna sex you up. Calorie bad. Oh boy. Goodness gracious. Oh well. There's... I just actually I just happened across like a uh, an old YouTube, maybe not even that old, of them like playing at some kind of like very sad corporate event yeah. and like yeah. got into like a fist fight on stage and like one of the guys got arrested. Oh, Did you my. hear that? No, they you really have to, like it was color yeah. me bad. <laughs> I guess they are yeah. bad, huh? <laughs> That's too funny. Color me drunk. Color me drunk, was, more likely. Yeah. 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 Are you listening to anything now that's kind of like blowing your mind? Is there I mean, obviously your son's band is phenomenal. And uh They're great, Dear Elise. Yeah, Dear Elise. And uh what is the name of their band uh, any correlation at all to Letters to Cleo? Is there a connection there because of the letter aspect? I don't think so. They, okay. they were, they were all in, um, like music, like they went to like Paramount school of music oh. together where Michael, uh, Henry's dad, my ex-husband is yes. uh, a teacher there. And so Henry and those kids have been the, the band, they've been playing together since they were like 13 and like That's all so these cool. other things and just very talented and just the sweetest kids really, really good. Yeah. Really yeah, good. But yeah. they're all like college. They're in college now. So they kind of got to pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. This is the, this is that yeah. time. This is that, uh, where you were, you know, when you were in a band with your friends and you're like, this isn't mm-hmm. necessarily a career, but then it became one. And so now be right. pose the same question to your, to your son. Well, you know, will it be a career or will it not? Who knows? Who knows? I, I, I hope he does. <laughs> I hope he does something else. <laughs> <laughs> right. From, I, from the mom not, who has lived the life, mom and dad who lived the life. Cause I met Michael right, as well right. and, 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 uh, have been through the whole thing. You know, it is funny because you want your kids to pursue their dreams and follow their heart and follow their passions. But when you've experienced so much of, you know, the music industry, the acting industry, all these, all these businesses that are just filled with so much, ugh. You know, Uns- just in uncertainty and yes, you know, it's hard. It is. So, I mean, but I, I would support him no matter what he wants to But His, his true love is movies. He's movies. like really into it. And that's like our thing that we do together is movies. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So, I- he's an awesome drummer. And he's uh, devastatingly handsome. So if he were to pursue the, the music thing, he'd probably do good. Yeah. But I think I think he I think there's something else out there that he wants to whatever he whatever either of them want to do. Totally. It's like I I want them to do it. Yeah. I just hope that it's like something 
where like you can climb the ladder and like there's some predictability to it. Like totally. Cause yeah, it's hard. It is hard. You, As you know. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not faced with the question yet. Cause my, my, I have two sons and my, my oldest is 13, you know, he's starting to start, starting to find his place in the world, but you know, I'm, I'm sure they'll be faced with a lot of the same quandaries and yeah, we just want them to succeed, but love what they do. That's right. It. And have that yeah. stable life together. But but I, but I was going to say, is there any music, I said your son's band, but is there any other music right now that's really like, wow, this is great? Or is, uh, is, are you too busy making your own? I, um, I'm really loving my, uh, like, you know how when you just like your, you know, Apple music will just like start playing me stuff. Yeah. And, um, and I'm really loving, there's a couple of bands, I mean, it's okay if I look. Of course. This is the Waterproof um, Records podcast is chill. <laughs> let's see. Okay. So, um, Cause there's a okay. lot of music now, you know, with the, with the way that we can access music as opposed to when you and I grew up and you had to go to a record store and chase it out there. Right. It's like now how it's really hard to stand out because everybody searches for a digital format and, I can't find the songs that I was. Nah. That's okay. um shit. I'll, I'll get back to you. Round like, two, I round just, two. We'll have a follow up podcast <laughs> a year uh, from now. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but yeah, I just I love I love like a lot of like the indie rock that's coming out right now, especially yeah. like the female led stuff is just blowing my mind. Yeah, just yeah. so good. Yeah. So good. Well, and I know we've, we've been going for a while. I don't want to keep you forever, but I have been seeing, you know, one thing that's so cool about you is you're either the co-executive director of the songwriters of North America and mm-hmm. you, you yeah. are incredibly passionate. I think it's worth mentioning to our listeners um, this thing with Spotify and you're very passionate about it. And I, I think <laughs> let's get the word out there about this fight, which is a huge deal for you. Do you mind just kind of breaking that down a little bit for them? Well, yeah, I mean, there's so I mean the 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 brouhaha over spot you know Neil Young, Joe Rogan, uh, yeah, he he you know issued an ultimatum to Spotify last week that right. that Spotify could either have Neil Young music or right. they could have disinformation and anti science propaganda, yeah. but they could not have both. <laughs> right, right, right. And Spotify responded by taking Neil Young's music down. Yeah. So. I mean, to me, um, you know, the, the, I wear two hats. Like one is the, you know, co-executive director of Songwriters of North, North America. We're, we're concerned with the, do you know that songs are like revenue? It's two pies, right? It's two right. sets of rights. There's sure. the sound recording, which is like the the record, the, the, the thing that you buy, the, the recording artist owns those re- and the record label owns right, the master. Right. And then on the other side, there's like the copyright, which is sort of like the music and lyric, if you think of it as like the sheet music. Yeah. Um, so Sona fights on that side, on the copyright side. And that's sure. kind of our lane. That's where we... So Sona did not get involved in this. But I, as a recording artist, was like, knowing what I know about the the way Spotify has changed since they first came on the scene and they promised all of these beautiful, amazing things to, you know, songwriters and recording artists and, you know, and have, you know, have not, have wound up not being a great actor in the space. And they have done some things over the years and made some changes in their mission that demonstrate that their focus, even though, Daniel Eck has made his billions in Spotify with music, yeah. you know, the thing that we make, Yes, <laughs> you know, and, uh, he, uh, his, he has taken those billions of dollars and instead of, you know, sharing the wealth, um, he is giving $300 million to a person who, is spreading it's a podcast it's not music first right, of all right, which right. is kind of like what yeah um yeah and and you know and he investing in the in like this ai defense company yeah. helsing and you know it, these are things that um 
are problematic. Like when, when that, I just think about in the nineties, like if someone had, like you would never work with a company who right. would do these things, right. like a, a, a music distributor who was engaged in like the racism and sexism, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and had like politics, had politics that were diametrically opposed to usually what the artist is. Right. 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 You know? Um, so I, I jumped in very, very, but a lot of, you know, a, the thing that was great is that my work in Sona is sort of like, it's boring cause it's copyright and we're trying to change the laws and we're going through legislation and we're yeah. meeting, you know, we're going to Washington and it's, it's not sexy. Yeah. It's really boring. <laughs> so like the chance to fight on this side, on the recording artist side and like just I think when Spotify did what they did, it un, it sort of like kicked the door open to a lot of resentment that was already sort of yeah. was was already there, but people just didn't feel like there was any that there was anything we could do about it. Right. And or that like weren't sure why this felt bad. And that whole situation was just just open the floodgates. And yeah. Yeah. Now a lot of people are getting involved. I just had a um, a piece come out, and I wrote a guest column for Variety that came out today. I and, saw it. I saw it. Uh, Very cool. Yeah, that's why I wanted to ask and, you about it. It's it's kind of the it's the talk right now, and I was like, this is important. Mm-hmm. And what I really gleaned from it is that that this was a, a spotlight shined on on Spotify from from this story, and it's not really even mm-hmm. about that. It's about what they've been it's doing. Not. This whole time that it's like we that need this to. This is just part of totally. A pattern, let's you know? let's call out what they've been doing to artists and how they've been not you know taking care of the people who provide the music, mm-hmm. and that's what needs but to be discussed. The thing that I loved about last week was that like so after the Neil Young thing, you know you we can't take our music off of Spotify. We don't. Most recording artists do not own the master rights to their. Like sure. the letters to Cleo records belong to Warner brothers. So they'll and put it on there. My solo. Stuff. Yeah. So, and we can't, we have to go through Warner to take it. It's like, you know, we have no rights. It's right, right. crazy. Um, so the thing that I thought was really fun is that last week, like trying to keep the, the story alive, trying to keep it going. And it was like me, be- the girls from belly and, uh, Max from Eve six and Damon from galaxy 500 and like all these not eighties and nineties people like I love it. keeping, keeping it alive. And, uh, but over the weekend, some other stuff has come to light. That's pretty serious with his and black artists are like, mm. Mm. <laughs> like, no, I mean, yeah. his use of, I mean, just the yeah. casual hate is like yeah. really weird. Yeah. It's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm I'm glad we could give a little voice to it here and people should definitely Thank learn. You. Yeah, absolutely. I want to share about love of music, but I also want to share what's important to my guests and uh what what they're what they're facing right now and what mm-hmm. they're dealing with and um you know, I am just so grateful you took the time to be on the show with me and I just consider you to be such a wonderful new friend in my life. And I just, uh, just so happy. Um, Can't wait to see you again once the world is open and we're free. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just so grateful that Jay introduced us and, um, and I'm so glad you came on the show. Is there anything else that before we wrap this up that you'd like to share or people can check out? I mean, support your animated shows that you're working on. Ada Twist Scientist season yes. two just started on Netflix and it's so good. All right, it's the Go best. Check it out, everybody. Ada Twist Scientist, yeah. Yes, I love uh, but it. I think that's it. Thank you so much for having me, Jacob. This is really a great conversation. And, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad. And perfect. We're ending just in time for me to go stir my soup again. And that's right. That's I think right. I'm gonna. That's great. <laughs> I love it. Kay, thank you so much. Kay from Letters to Cleo and a million other things. Uh, support their music. Uh, listen to her solo stuff. It's really, really cool. And uh, just, yeah, I look forward to seeing what you're going to do next. So thank you. Oh, oh, oh she's got that thought. Uh, my, per- my first solo record, uh, Cherry Marmalade, came yes. out 20 years ago this year. So I'm doing a vinyl double album release this year. Love and, it. Uh, hitting the road for that. So. so keep an eye out for the 20 year reunion of Cherry yeah. Marmalade, your first solo record that came out in 2002. Yeah. That, 
oh my god you look good well i guess math yeah <laughs> hey we're artists right you know I, I i only i only know because i think i saw it written so anyway all right <laughs> well have a wonderful stew and uh <laughs> and i really appreciated this time and we'll, we'll see you next time thanks for joining us on waterproof records Records with Jacob.